Hey everybody, Matt here at Wheels Through Time. If you guys have been following along, you know and you saw that some incredible history just came right here to Wheels Through Time, uh, all revolving around one of the incredibly rare and special bikes we've got here inside the museum. So for you guys have seen, we did the whole video uh, firing the bike up, unboxing the trophy that they sent, the scrapbooks here, uh, just incredible stuff. We just had a few minutes to scratch the surface. So today we're gonna learn more about what's inside these books. We're gonna deep dive right into it, learn more about the person that Cliff Palmer was. As we mentioned before, uh, about 11 years ago, I went to Michigan uh, and picked up an ultra rare 1919 Harley Davidson racing sidecar. The thing about the bike is we never had any history on it whatsoever. Uh, as it would be, we get a phone call from Andrew Hinckley, who was actually a family member of the guy that used to race the sidecar. It was his great grandson. Turns out he had an incredible amount of history revolving around the motorcycle. So today, super special day, we've got a phone call scheduled with Andrew and his mother, Martha. Uh, let's get on the phone. Hello. Hey, Andrew, how do you do? Good, good. All right, excellent, excellent. So we're just sitting down and we've got the crowd with us. Uh, we're shooting a show right now and uh, wanted to get with you and talk more about your great grandfather and, and you know, hear more about him as a person and, and learn more of his history. And uh, Andrew, I don't know if you had a, check, a chance to check out the video and especially the comments, but uh, just an incredible response for you uh, making the decision to preserve this history and, and share it with everybody. So from myself and everybody here at the museum, and I think a lot of our visitors, uh, thank you very much for, or for seeing that this history was all, all put back together. Yeah. Yep. And I really do appreciate, I did get a chance to check the video out and there was lots of really nice comments on there. So I do appreciate that. So one of the things I noticed, and you said your mother's with us, right? Yes, my mom, Marsha, is with us also. Uh, hi, Marsha, how are you doing? Good, how are you? I'm very, very well. Thank you for joining us. And one of the things that I got wrong in the video uh, was that it wasn't your dad's side, it was actually your mother's side that Cliff Palmer was on. It was, it was, so that was, Marsha, that was your grandfather? Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Well, we're, we're hoping to, you know, l learn more from your perspective on just exactly who uh, he was and the first thing I want to kind of highlight is some of these photographs. And I know that you, uh, Andrew, probably are going to be familiar with a lot of the photos that we're talking about. Um, some of these racing photographs just continue to tell a story about, you know, where he stood in the racing game at the time. And, um, you know, a lot of these early racing motorcycles, guys like us, we couldn't even get these bikes. They were very special machines. Racing these motorcycles uh, at the highest level was a pretty narrow game and there were not a lot of people that got to participate. So he really must have been, you know, quite the rider. And we can see that in the photographs. I mean, some of these photographs, you can get the illusion of speed in these photographs and see that he, you know, to have a 19 teens era motorcycle and be out there running 80 miles an hour with a side hack hanging off the side is 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 pretty incredible and what i've seen is kind of the earliest era it looks like he was racing a pretty stock bike uh, that he just stripped down, which is not the bike that we have here in the museum. So what I'm saying is there appears to be several different, uh, or at least a couple different race bikes. Now, Martha, did you ever have a chance to look through these, uh, the scrapbook uh, with the photographs? No, I didn't, uh-uh. Well, right when you open it, it's this beautiful leather scrapbook that's got some great photographs and, you know, early motorcycle polo stuff. It looks like he was a member of the, it says BC Motorcycle Club, organized September 4th, 1923, 27 members. And they had, a, it was 100% a uh, attendance and 
Uh, it was an MATA governed club. So the, the MATA, which a lot of folks don't know about it, nowadays we have the AMA, the American Motorcyclist Association. The American Motorcyclist Association started, I believe, in 1925, which is really neat because your great grandfather, Andrew, was racing right at this transfer from the the MATA, the Motorcycle Allied Trade Association, uh, moving over to the AMA. So as it would be, that's an era that there's just not a lot of documentation uh, about because it's it's that crossover era where the sanctioning bodies of, cl of motorcycle clubs and the sanctioning bodies of racing uh, it, it changed over entirely so that's one of the things that you know tells me why his name may have been left out of what we know about racing during that era today um, one of the neat things is that I found an article in the newspaper clippings that referred to, to Cliff as the nervy 19 year old from Battle Creek uh, in, in one of the, the race uh, results and by this time and when he's 19 years old he's winning lots of races I think this was in 1924 so if this was given in 23 it looks like uh, you know, he's probably 17, 18 years old uh, in the photograph. It's a photo of uh, the motorcycle is generally dark. And in 1923 and, or 22 and 23, they had a, a different color than before and after where the green was really dark. And it's called Brewster Green. And you can see, even though these are black and white photographs, this is that dark green 1922 or 23 motorcycle with a flexi sidecar on it. He's uh, all dressed up in his, his gear. It looks like it's kind of cold weather. He's got a dog in the sidecar, um, which for me hits close to home because me and my dad rode around with our dogs in sidecars for as long as I can remember. And I think from the first racing photographs that we have of Cliff at the track uh, which I'm guessing was in 23 or 24 uh, it looks like it's this motorcycle stripped down and so he pulled the fenders off uh, pulled the headlight and the horn off uh, uh, pulled the sidecar fender off and set this thing up uh, for racing which is you know that's how a lot of guys got started is they started on stock motorcycles and uh went out and and being that the the special equipment wasn't available available to everybody uh they went out and started started racing and if you proved yourself you you probably uh you know move to that next level to be able to get a hold of some of the really special equipment um so he lived in Battle Creek his whole life? Yes. Wow. Yep. Wow, amazing. So a lot of these photographs um, are from the... Those are right right in front of his house. I know a lot of those in the background is the, his front porch of his house. Yeah, I'm, those are from his front yard. I'm looking at one right now with a front porch in the background. Um, and it's that looks like that same Brewster Green motorcycle. And uh, so is that where you, you were born, Martha, and you, Andrew, too? You guys have been in Battle Creek that whole time. Uh, well, yeah, we've moved around since. But, yeah, um, I was born in Hastings, Michigan, which is not too far from Battle Creek. And uh, my mom was born in Battle Creek. Sh sure. Yeah, we, we, this is what we call home, Battle Creek. That's what you call home. And, and so for the, the materials here, how long – did you have all of this stuff, Andrew? And how did it come to you? Tell us a little bit of that story. I honestly don't remember how I acquired it. If uh, my grandfather gave it to me when he acquired the estate or if I just uh, grabbed it up. I do remember as a child seeing the trophy on his TV and uh, you know, I was always enamored by it and uh, always wanted to end up with it. And, I, and about 30, probably 30, 35 years ago, I think I acquired it one way or the other. I either um, took it out or it was through, through my grandfather which is Cliff's son through Cliff's yeah. son and, and how old are you Andrew? I'm 30 or <laughs> I'm 40 I'm 48 years old I'm sorry you, I wish I was 30 you wish you were 38 yeah 48 years old yeah. so wow you were like a, your early teens when you when yeah, you yeah, pre-teen yeah like an early teen yeah by um I, I acquired it, so I've been hanging on to it for a really long time. Amazing, and and you've probably flipped through these photographs and scrapbooks a hundred times. Oh, I, 
I'm the one that wore it out, I'm sure, and showing it off to a few people and just going through it and yeah. Now, I don't know if you remember it, uh, Andrew, but there's a photograph of the bike that like heavily mangled, like wrecked. Did you ever see that photograph? Oh, yes. Oh, man. And, and I'm staring at it now and it looks like the bikes in multiple pieces. Um, the, the handlebars are gone, the front wheels off of it, the, the bikes thrown in the back of this trailer and they just piled the sidecar sidecars got all crazy bent wheel and all, uh, piled it on top of, uh, on top of the bike. Like they just, they threw it all in a trailer and headed home with it. And, and there's a mention in one of the articles that he was injured racing. And I don't know if you ever saw that. Did you? Uh, I don't know, but I don't remember reading that one. Yeah, I, I read through that he, I think that he injured his ankle is what it mentioned. Um, and, you know, th again, it's it's difficult to see which, uh, you know, what configuration of the bike this was from the angle that it had shot at. What you can tell is it is the factory race chassis and it's got a reinforced fork and you can see that it's the same skinny little sidecar but i don't know if uh if you notice the photos of my sidecar here of of, of your great grandfather's racing rig the back of that sidecar has been broken off at some point and they like capped it with a piece of wood back there and i'm wondering if that might be this photograph might be the instance where they decided to modify that sidecar into its current configuration today. Um, one of the most amazing photographs in the scrapbook is a photo, it's in the pits, and like the bike is a bit shrouded, but you can tell that it's Cliff, because uh, he had that little skull cap. I don't know if you remember the the so I have, a, I have a funny story about that i i did have that at one time i had that and it was just an old leather football helmet is what it was a leather football um, helmet I didn't have that up until the 90s and i've been researching on where it might have went but i i come up dead-handed so far but uh i did have his skull cap at one time wow did it fit you no oh, i have a big head <laughs> <laughs> no, he, uh, people were smaller back then uh you know they my, sure uh, were my grandfather Charlie, uh, his um, service uniform, he was in the Marines, his service uniform, and I couldn't even fit in that when I was eight years old. Wow, no way. People were taller back then. <laughs> yeah, we were, it's, it's a whole different deal nowadays, that's for sure. We see that in the, the helmets that are here at the museum. We've got some similar helmets to like what you're speaking about, and um, you know, the helmets, the jerseys, and I'm sure they might have shrunk over time a little bit, you know, being leather, but. It's, uh, it's very rare to find one uh, that fits somebody today. For sure. um, yeah. Zero safety back then. It was a leather helmet and uh, 80 miles an hour. <laughs> yeah, unbelievable. And, you know, like, like we said, no brakes and no clutch. And, and the, just to see the, the dust in some of these tracks, I mean, there's a photo of him laid over in one of the turns here. And there is just a cloud of dust and you can barely see another wheel in this cloud and there was some serious incentive for not being in second place uh yeah, just sure. just yes. just from the dust i want so this photograph i'm looking at right now uh is cliff in the pits and it looks like he's got somebody helping him down on their like they're checking the sidecar out and right next to him and this is the craziest thing. Right next to him is my pal Mike Lang's sidecar um, in, the, in the pits right next to him. And it, it, what we've found through your photographs is it, it, you, the one, one, two of the photographs in, in this uh, scrapbook kind of redefine that bike's history. And that bike um, is, is among the, one of the rarest m motorcycles on the planet. And it's, it, it redefines that motorcycle's racing history. We've got photos of these two bikes, your great grandfather's bike, the bike here at the museum, uh, and Mike Lang's bike, um, racing as far back as 1924 and 1925. So, and, and we had always thought that Mike's bike was first raced in, or first 
built even by the factory in 1929. Um, so it, what's so neat about it is when we went out and raced these in 2012, we always thought, you know, ah, oh, well, what if these things actually raced against each other? And we kind of deduced through what was known about the bikes at the time that it probably wasn't possible or wasn't the case. As it turns out, um, through indisputable photographic evidence uh, that these bikes actually raced against each other uh, uh, 80 years, 90 years prior to when uh, we got out and, and put them on the track again. So really, really neat history. So that raised the question, and this is where we get into some of these uh, racing uh, programs and what we really can delve into in the, 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 I'm gonna leave that photo out because it's just amazing. I love staring at this stuff. Um, well, that re just redefines, it, 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 it's, you know, the, the scrapbook, when we look at that photograph with, with Mike's bike, you know, and knowing about the Class A racing chassis, as we flip through the scrapbook, one of the things that was on the first it was actually the first thing that you saw when you opened up the scrapbook um, was that Altoona Speedway National Championship July 4th, 1925 racing program. Do you remember that, Andrew? Yes, I do. Yeah, I've got it right in my hands right now and pinned right to the front of it is a rider ribbon, which we can only assume was at first glance was uh, was Cliff's rider ribbon. Now, the Altoona Speedway is one of the most famous speedways uh, that, that there ever was. It was a mile and a quarter track. Uh, the fastest speed ever attained on a board track racing motorcycle was at the Altoona Speedway. 120 miles an hour, if you guys can believe that. Holy that was Curly Fredericks on an Indian. Uh, and that was, I think, maybe 1928 that he set that record. But these are two by fours stacked up the tall way. Um, so t on a wooden track, uh, 120 miles an hour uh, on these types of motorcycles. And there are numerous pieces of information from the Altoona Speedway. Uh, one of the things we found, it's it's like a little, it's like a, it's blue, it's a brochure. And on the front it says, revival of the most thrilling and dangerous of all sports. July 4th, 1925, it was like a little handout that you got maybe at the track. Um, and this is in 1925 under the rules and with sanction of the American Motorcyclist Association, Motorcycle Association. So this is like one of the first AMA events, uh, the Altoona Speedway race. And inside it's a, it says the fastest riders of the world eligible for big classic. And in this is a list of about 20 names. And you've got names like Ralph Hepburn, Paul Anderson, Jim Davis, Johnny Seymour, Eddie Brink, Floyd Dreyer, uh, William Minnick, Bill Minnick, and there your great-grandfather is in that list of people, Cliff Palmer, um, fastest riders of the world eligible for big classic. So if that isn't some sort of confirmation as to where your great grandfather stood in the scheme of things at the time. I mean, he he was not just a very accomplished rider, but he was a recognized rider. And it's that's something that I don't know if you guys ever were able to kind of deduce that sort of perspective, but um, very few people um, were racing at these sorts of events and and to get out on the world's biggest and fastest tracks with the biggest names. I mean, Ralph Hepburn. Ralph Hepburn was a member of the Harley Davidson Wrecking Crew and uh, the Wrecking Crew in the, the 19, early 1920s, I mean, they racked up every single victory that could be had. Uh, Paul Anderson raced for Harley Davidson, raced for Excelsior. Jim Davis, another member of the Harley Davidson wrecking crew. Eddie Brink, uh, Eddie Brink raced well into the, the mid-1920s, uh, was one of the fastest guys. And uh, I actually, there's a newspaper article in here that talks about uh, Brink took all honors uh, at the the weekends races and I can't remember exactly I think it might have been the Detroit 
uh, national championship races. But second in line was Cliff Palmer, who beat out all other riders and stayed consistent throughout the program. So he raced in like five or six races that day and in each race uh, was on the podium and, and that's a really a neat and rare thing to see. Um, now inside of this national championship uh, program from 1925, um, here we are, 1925 motorcycle, uh, championship motorcycle races, and here you've got uh, the entrance list. And I don't know if you know this, but Cliff was racing not just in the sidecar class, but he was racing in the two-wheel class also. We've actually got a photograph of Cliff standing next to his motorcycle in the pits, um, and they're taking the sidecar off, and the handlebars are off the bike and what they did was they had two different sets of handlebars for the races for the racers back then is they had your two wheel bars uh, that were dropped handlebars that actually were below the plane of the gas tanks and then there were the sidecar bars and I can only imagine those sidecars they take a considerable more effort to manhandle those things around the track so they'd have big wide handlebars or for those riders to really be able to use some leverage and what we found out is in this particular race, uh, Cliff placed fourth place and was running uh, in third place most of the race and had tire trouble and ended up um, ended up uh, uh, falling into fourth place. It's just really amazing stuff. There's more race programs here that you guys. Uh, I don't know if you ever had a chance to delve into. This is from the Miami Fairgrounds at Toledo, and there he is. Uh, entry list for sidecar events. Um, there he is, Ralph Hepburn, Los Angeles, California, right above uh, Cliff Palmer, Battle Creek, Michigan, Bill Minnick. So these guys, and what's really wild is there's a photo of a fella named Bill Minnick, Andrew, that he, it's kind of the most famous flexible sidecar racing photo, and it's the, it's not a race photo, it's him after winning the national championship. It's the Wisconsin State Fair. Um, here it is. Um, this is amazing. Um, this is the official program for the national championship races at the Wisconsin State Fair Park, August 10th, 1924, and there's a photograph of Bill Minnick after winning that national championship race that's kind of become the most circulated photograph out there uh, of flexible sidecar racing. And here we've got the uh, sidecar event and Bill Minnick takes first in that sidecar event and you guys I'm sure can only guess uh, who placed second. Uh, it was your, your great grandfather. So. Um, the way I look at it is that one place. If your great grandfather wins that race, then every history book that that's out there today with Bill Minnick's picture in it very likely could have instead had Cliff Palmer's. So really neat. One of the neat letters that I saw, uh, and I've got it right in front of me right now, is from the out it's on altoona speedway letterhead world's fastest track national motorcycle champion july 4th 1925 and it's addressed to cliff palmer belknap envelope company um battle creek michigan and it says your letter to ec e. smith has been forwarded uh, by him to us we regret the circumstances are such that it's not feasible for us to grant appearance money even to such riders who are recognized as the leaders so he sent in altoona speedway saying you know hey i'd love to come to your race but uh can you hook me up on some appearance money and then they go on and they say 
For this future, we seek your co cooperation, knowing that a rider of your recognized ability will certainly secure a good part of these rich purses. So even the folks at the track, uh, it shows they, they really had a lot of respect uh, for what Cliff was doing and uh, uh, the, the rider that he was. And, and you know, what, one of the questions I have is like, what drove your grandfather to race? Well, I haven't heard a whole bunch about his racing. Um, I just more know him from his business that he owned. So he was a printer? Yeah, he owned an envelope company. I owned an envelope company, and one of the really neat photos that you'd sent with us, uh, Andrew, was a photo, and it, I mean, he looks young here. He, he, how old was he when he started the print shop, do you know? I think in his teens, I think 18, hmm. somewhere around there. 18 years old, I don't know what you, Maybe Possibly sooner, possibly, I, I'm not really sure there. So the, 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 the printing, you know, and, I, and I'm just, you know, Dave, what, what do you know about how he got into motorcycle racing? I mean, and, and motorcycling in general, because it, it seems like two pretty different uh, genres to, uh, to, to be a part of. Was it the printing that, that running his own business that got him financially secure enough to be able to go out and buy race bikes and stuff like that? No, I know he's always been into speed, and uh, he, he, after his motorcycle career, he raced cars. And uh, What kind of cars did he race, do you know? Uh, I know he used to race Corvettes, um, and probably a few other things too, but I, I'm positive Corvettes. Um, like I said, he, he, was, he was wealthy in his day, so um, he could afford to race. Yeah. Every year he buy a new Corvette. Every year he'd buy. Remember that. And Every the, year. The last vehicle he owned was a DeLorean. A DeLorean, wow. Yeah, he always had a Corvette and a Cadillac, and then his last vehicle was a DeLorean. Yeah. Every year he'd get a Cadillac and a, and a Corvette every year. And, uh, he had the need for speed, I'll tell you. He, it, all the way up to his 90s, I'll tell you. He, he liked to go fast. Well, yeah, going up to his 90s, and I mean, racing the Corvettes. You know, the yeah. Corvette came out in 53, so he'd have been in his 40s and 50s racing those Corvettes. He uh, had just about every year a Corvette, even. He had the split window, he had them all. The last one he bought was the Stingray. The Stingray. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, just, you know, history is, is uh, there's, there's so much history in, in this stuff, and... Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm really glad I got all that information. I'm really glad I found you when I did, because like I said, that it was deteriorating every time you open it, you know, it falls apart. And we, we found each other at the right time, and uh, I'm glad you got it, so. Well, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Andrew. And, and like I said, our, 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 our crew here at the museum, when they, you know, we all gathered together to take a look at this stuff, it was, it's, it's just, you know, this place is all about history and you guys have contributed an immense amount to that. And I don't know that, that I could ever thank you enough. We're, we're uh, gonna be great stewards of this stuff. And, and one of the, the proudest things for me um, is that, you know, your great grandfather is, we're, we're putting him back in the history books where he really should have been all along. So, um, you know, you can, uh, you know, rest assured that, you know, Cliff Palmer was a, a, a name for the ages. And from, from here forward, we're going to be able to keep that, that legacy alive. Yep, that, that is great. That's, that's great. Uh, you know, the thing about this, Andrew, is the history is so delicate what we'll do is we'll probably create some storyboards where we can share what's here uh, without jeopardizing the material itself, but very yeah, amazing. Sure. Uh, the trophy's sitting right next to me right now, uh, and uh, here in, in uh, just a, a short bit, we're gonna be installing this uh, trophy in a special showcase that we've got here at the museum uh, with some of the, the amazing photos and racing programs and uh, this this is uh, it's gonna be on display uh, for people here to see and uh, the history will will carry on man thank you very much Andrew all right well I super appreciate it and, and uh, thanks again for all the nice messages on, um, on YouTube and 
uh, can't wait to see you next year. All right, Andrew, Martha, it was very nice talking with you over the phone, and, and I'm looking forward to meeting you guys both in person uh, here in, in six, eight months or so. All right, sounds good. All right, y'all, take care. Yeah, thank you, Matt. <laughs> Bye-bye. Just amazing. I mean, this is what we live for. Um, when history comes back together like this, uh, I don't know that you could really ever ask for anything more. Uh, as a, a, a motorcycle collector, a, a, a historian, uh, this is, for me, it's, it's the thrill of a lifetime. I mean, it, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity uh, to put this stuff back together. So often, these things get lost. Uh, you know, history diverts and never comes back together. Uh, thanks to Andrew and his family, this stuff's going to live uh, with that motorcycle forever. So incredibly excited. Thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, witnessing history right here in the Making It Wheels Through Time. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you hit the like button. Uh, tune in often because history happens every day right here at wheels through time uh and we're bringing it to you guys uh thanks for everything you do thanks for your support uh thanks for tuning in i'm gonna dive back into this book and see what else i can find and uh cliff palmer national champion come see the machine right here at wheels